Uh, members, the time being 2.32, I call on question time. Any members with a question? The Honourable Member for Derwent. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, President. My question is to the Attorney-General. Uh, just around budget issues, um, I'm not on the committee that will get to interrogate you fiercely uh, next week. So, um, Attorney, the federal uh, government has uh, cut $500,000 a year from the Tasmanian community legal centres across the state. Um, we welcome the uh, state government's decision to allocate 496000 this financial year. Um, but can the attorney uh, commit to funding the shortfall to community legal aid centres across board estimates? Uh, attorney, I'm informed that uh, without this commitment, then up to eight solicitors could lose their jobs from uh, community legal centres. Young leader. Yes, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for Derwent uh, for his uh, question. So the situation is that, um, as he indicated, the government will provide an additional 496000 to the legal assistance sector in 2016-17 uh, as part of our reinvestment in essential services. And the new funding is in addition to the baseline funding provided by the government under the National Partnership Agreement on Legal Assistance Services legal assistance and also the 300000 in recurrent funding announced as part of the government's family violence action plan. And the issue was that um, there was a decision by the federal government to reduce funding in 2015 and in fact the Tasmanian government uh, stepped in to provide additional financial support uh, to CLCs in the 2015-16 financial year to make up the shortfall in Commonwealth funding and we were also able to obtain from the Commonwealth some additional transitional funding to lessen the immediate impact of the funding reduction uh, at that point as well. Uh, we will continue to work with uh, the Federal Government of whatever flavour post uh, the election to uh, try and negotiate mm. with them an increase in funding for the CLCs and legal aid. But importantly, we've stepped in at this point uh, to provide the additional $496,000 for the 2016-17 uh, year to make sure that um, they can maintain their services. But we are always working uh, with the CLCs and legal aid. It's also important to note that... Um, the CLCs and Legal Aid benefit from uh, grants from the Solicitors Guarantee Fund uh, virtually every year uh, and I'm sure uh, there will be uh, an advertisement in relation to the Solicitors Guarantee Fund in the not too distant future seeking applications. Uh, that is a competitive process of course. Uh, but importantly we are also um, continuing to closely engage with CLCs and the Legal Aid Commission about opportunities to increase links between them and therefore assist more Tasmanians with the funding that, it's that is available. And the Legal Aid Commission is talking to CLCs about a No Wrong Door initiative um, to give Tasmanians easier access to the legal assistance sector and direct them to the legal assistance organisation which is best placed to help them. And while we have a number of fantastic legal assistance organisations in the state, we know that it can be confusing for people trying to work out which organisation to contact uh, when they need help. A no wrong door approach would involve the whole sector promoting a single phone number or point of contact uh, which people needing assistance or advice can call and then be put straight through to whichever service has the most relevant expertise uh, to help them. So the Legal Aid Commission and CLCs have begun discussing the no, raw, no wrong door concept and I do look forward to further developments in that space. The Honourable Member for Elwick. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. My question is to the Attorney-General. Attorney, the budget papers in the justice portfolio area show employee expenses across the forward estimates rise by just 1.4 per cent, while the state wages policy is an increase of 2 per cent. Attorney, how many staff in the important justice area do you intend to show the door? Are there embedded job cuts in the justice portfolio? Thank you. 
thank uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Elwick for, I think it's his first Bush question. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> so, well done. I'm sure it's the first of uh, many more to come. And you, of course, will have the opportunity to grill me uh, in budget estimates because you're on the relevant uh, committee. Um, the short answer to your question is that there are no job cuts embedded in the um, Justice Department budget. Uh, as we stressed last year, the heavy lifting has been done in relation to the implementation of the sensible saving strategies uh, we incorporated in the 2014-15 uh, budget. Uh, so because uh, we've been responsible in managing the budget um, and living uh, within our means to the greatest extent possible, we've been able to reinvest in central services. And that's why uh, you'll see some of the initiatives in this year's budget around um, funding provided to the Public Guardian, uh, among others, and also uh, in, the con in the correction context uh, in relation to the funding for the uh, additional uh, two FTEs uh, for the delivery of the sex offender treatment, which is closely aligned with our um, policy around uh, appropriate treatment for sex offenders. Uh, so um, really that's, I guess, the short answer uh, to your question, and you can um, drill down into it deeper next week should you wish to. Uh, my questions are to the leader and relate to Imperial Tobacco and uh, any other big tobacco companies and any meetings contact had with them by the Minister for Health and or his department. Will the leader please advise one? Since the election of the Hodgman Liberal Government, has the Minister or his department met with Andrew Gregson of Imperial Tobacco? Two. If so, how many times have, has, have the Minister or his department met and who else has been present during those meetings? Three, which staff members in the Minister's office, if meetings have taken place, that is, have met with British American Tobacco, Imperial Tobacco or Philip Morris representatives in the last two years? Four, Four if applicable, what was discussed and or agreed at these meetings? Five, is the Minister aware that the Australian Government has ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, FCTC? Six, is the Minister aware that guidelines to Article 5.3 e of the FCTC say, one, 2.1, parties should interact with the tobacco industry only when and to the extent strictly necessary to enable them to effectively regulate the tobacco industry and tobacco products, in other words, poison, 2.2, where interactions with the tobacco industry are necessary, parties should ensure that such interactions are conducted transparently. Whenever possible, interactions should be conducted in public, for example, through public hearings, public notice, or should be conducted in public, for example, through public hearings, public notices of interactions, disclosures of records of such interactions to the public. And the, when I mentioned poison, that was my word. Oh, my goodness, there's a bit of uh, change going on in the chair at the moment. <laughs> Mr Deputy President, lovely to see you here. Uh, and I thank the Honourable Member for winning <laughs> me. <laughs> oh, no, I was just a bit confused. It wasn't who I was, I was expecting to see. But anyway, two of uh, Minister Ferguson's staff met with uh, Mr Andrew Gregson from Imperial Tobacco in early 2016. The meeting took place at Mr Gregson's request and specifically and only related to the government's proposal to raise the minimum legal smoking age to 21 or 25, which is opposed by Imperial Tobacco. During the period since the government released the Healthy Tasmania Community Consultation Draft, Minister Ferguson and his office have met with a large number of industry and health stakeholders in relation to this proposal. It is a significant proposal and, as you would expect, it has elicited interest from a range of different groups and individuals. I'm advised that no other meetings between tobacco industry representatives and Minister Ferguson or his office have taken place during the, this term of government. I'm further advised that the only meetings that have occurred between officers of the Department of Health and Human Services and tobacco companies or their subsidiaries have been by policy and regulatory officers in the Public Health Services Division in relation to the regulation and control of tobacco products and e-cigarettes. 
Any further questions? Orders of the day.